session today is Get Smart on Creative Productive Learning Environments. And I'm joined by a group of experts from Corgan, a leading architect and design firm with a strong education track record. I want to welcome David Usher, AJ Sesteta, and Sagitha Karthik. Thanks for being here, team, and welcome to the pod. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. us. David, let's start with you. In addition to being a vice president at Corgan, you also serve as the director at large for the American Society of Interior Designers. So talk to us a little bit about Corgan, your work in the K through 12 space, and of course, introduce us to your colleagues. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to both represent ASID and Corgan. So um, Corgan has had a long history in the education uh, sector, and uh, I'm I'm so pleased to have uh, AJ Sesteta and and Sankitha Karthik here to um, really talk about their expertise and uh, what they what they do day to day. But uh, the firm has had a long history. We're over uh, 80 years old, and we've been uh, doing schools and building uh, learning environments and communities for much of that time. Wonderful. Well, maybe I'll just ask you, AJ, to tell us a little bit about what you do at Corgan and then you as well, Sangeetha. Sure. So I'm AJ Sesteta and I am the education sector leader for the Corgan Houston office. So that means I am working on K through 12 design for public schools. And uh, we're also looking at getting some higher ed here as well. Thanks, AJ and Sangeetha. Hi, my name is Sangeeta Karthik. I'm one of the associate principals here in our education studio in the Dallas office. I've uh, just celebrated 20 years uh, with Corgan uh, this past week, and the entire time I have focused my career on uh, designing spaces for students to learn. I actually work both in the K-12 as well as the higher ed space, and so it's really interesting to see um, how the uh, transformational journey of a student starting at a pre-K level all the way through higher education and how our team can uh, shape the future generation. Well, happy anniversary, Sangeetha, and it's great to have the three of you here because I can't think of a more relevant time to be talking about the spaces in which our children spend most of their days. Uh, and uh, and I can tell you, as certainly as the mom to 11 and a five-year-old, I'm excited for them to get back to school. But like a lot of parents, I also have some, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure they're safe. So can you talk, and maybe David, I'll start with you, talk about why um, spaces where our children learn are so important. Um, why should we be thinking and talking uh, about it more um, and maybe start there and we'll bring the rest of the team in. Sure. Well, I think, um, you know, like you, um, we've had a, over the last, you know, uh, COVID period has been challenging for many reasons for, for our kids, for ourselves and work environments. But, um, and so we've all, we're, I think there's a heightened awareness now of uh, kind of health and well-being in a learning environment and wanting to make sure that our kids are safe. But it's something that we've always thought about. And I think once the daylight um, in, in classrooms has, has proven to, to improve you know, learning, um, better indoor air quality, um, makes people um, generally more productive and uh, helps uh, children in those environments. So it's, I think, as the science has uh, developed and we've learned more, we are applying that knowledge to learning environments for our kids uh, from you know, very young to all the way through college. And, and then those kinds of lessons uh, translate into you know, workplace design and so many other things where we know that design really impacts the lives of the people we serve. So AJ, maybe I'll turn to you and that's a great springboard. Um, what is a productive or optimized learning environment? What does that mean and how do you measure it? That's a really good question. I'm going to piggyback a little bit on David's last point. This is really all about the students. So to me, what makes a pro productive and effective learning environment is, is are you teaching effectively to the students? Uh, there are so many different learning types, so that looks so many different ways. I don't think there's one answer that's there's a fit all, but um, it's about providing a flexible space 
that the teachers and students can utilize to accommodate each individual learning style and teaching style. So what's effective to me is if a student comes out there more well-rounded in everything from math, English, and art, um, and we as designers are always thinking about how to maximize efficiency and productivity for that teaching and learning environment. Uh, so I don't think there's one metric that, that we all need to be pushing for. The only thing that we need to have in mind is a, as, a, as a goal for designers is, and, and I'm a parent myself, the parent is, are the students getting the most out of their day, um, whether that be peer-to-peer -peer learning, group learning, project-based learning, there are so many different ways to um, accommodate kids and to help them grow. So uh, it's it's not so prescriptive uh, in that regard, but that's what we're always, our end goal is always about the kids and the teachers and, and, and getting them to um, excel. Uh, it's super important, like David said. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I wasn't the best student and having uh, teachers uh, that supported me and wouldn't give up uh, really uh, helped me and I, I wouldn't really be here without without the support and belief from my educators all the way from K through um, higher ed. So thank you, AJ and Sangeetha. And I, of course, I invite David or AJ to contribute to this as well. But, you know, so in a previous episode, we've been we were talking with uh, school administrators who were talking about how much um, educational curriculum has changed over the last couple of decades. Uh, even, even the way that any of us learned is quite different than what our children are experiencing now. And so the need to evolve the educational curriculum is paramount. I'm wondering, so with that as context, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how has the modern classroom and school building changed over the last couple of decades. AJ, you sort of in, in, intimated that, you know, group project-based work, for example. Um, but Sangeetha, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. How has the modern classroom and school building changed? That's a really great question. I want to um, start off by saying that um, education as an institution is very slow to change. Um, so it has largely remained unchanged. Um, but uh, the last 10, 15 years has been very transformational. Uh, and we are very excited because um, the student that goes to a school has evolved, which means uh, finally we are realizing that the spaces that they need to be in also need to adapt and evolve with them. Um, as devastating as the pandemic the last 14, 16 months, and we are still dealing with the aftermaths, as you alluded to previously, has been we've, um, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, schools are important places, safe places for students and, and for everyone to send their kids to. And so um, what is really amazing is how the uh, personalized na uh, nature of education has come out of it, right? All of the things that AJ talked about um, is very individual to a student. And so just personalizing the education, providing them um, spaces where whether it's a very collaborative learner, it's a very uh, visual learner. So those type of spaces have uh, evolved. And, and, and quite honestly, I think we are going to see a rapid progression of the spaces and space types um, post pandemic, um, only because um, there were some hard lessons learned. I, I'm curious, and this is really maybe for, for any of you, AJ, Sangeetha, or David, uh, um, how much uh, around uh, building design, school building design is driven by what parents and students are asking for versus maybe what a, a school administration, or I'm just curious, what are the biggest factors for how schools are being designed and what kind of inputs are you hearing? Uh, so I'd love to hear from anyone who wants to, to grab that question. Sangeetha. Yeah, I'll go first on that. Um, that has been the most exciting part of our process and uh, really our job because we are seeing um, students being uh, involved firsthand in the design of education facilities. Uh, we are talking elementary school students because uh, these students want to have agency over their learning. Uh, they this is a generation, as we talked about before, that's used to carrying a, a you know high power computer in their pockets um, and can. can 
pretty much do anything, you know, from school to watching TV on their phones. Um, and so being able to involve the students because they want to be involved, um, but also in engaging the community and the other stakeholders besides leadership. Um, uh, we we are coming to understand that um, innovation is a is a process, and then we cannot go and be uh, go there and be creative uh, if we keep doing the same things over and over again. And so, uh, much like um, all of our other market sectors, we involve um, students from the start of visioning all the way through presentations um, because they are your user groups, and um, as well as the educators. We had done a, a survey that involved um, asking thousand educators all over the country certain questions about how the learning environments can um, can impact learning because for the educators the, the the schools and the colleges and the universities are workplaces right and then we are trying to attract talent and retain them and resoundingly over and over again like you know 96 97 percent have said the, the environments impact the learning 68 percent said that they wanted to base their decisions on the the classrooms and the buildings Buildings they are going to be working in, and so um, I think as as uh, education um, involves a lot of competition because you know all uh, institutions are competing for students, whether it's K twelve or higher ed. You're also competing for the 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 brightest and the best talent, and to be able to attract and retain um, buildings and environments uh, really are going to change. But back to the stakeholder question, yes, we involve uh, stakeholders, we involve communities, especially on all of our public projects. AJ, you look like you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, I really, I love what, what Sangeetha was just saying there. These, these facilities that we build, they are really community centric. So what we do really goes beyond what happens day to day inside the building. Uh, these facilities become staples of the communities they're in. People go vote there, there are local fairs there. Um, they become areas of refuge if there are weather events. And, and here I am in Houston. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's often that we do have significant weather events in our public schools become shelters for those that may not have um, a place to go. Uh, so it, what we do is super critical on so many levels, which is why it's so important to include stakeholders like Sangeetha was saying, uh, community members, parents, students, most importantly, um, who better to tell us how to be more effective than those stakeholders themselves. And AJ, your comment about uh, schools being really more community centers just resonates uh, so much for me because I can think about um, in my own community here in North Carolina, um, so much happens not school related at school, which means that that environment becomes all the more important for so many different um, stakeholders in the community. Um, AJ, I want to direct this question to you around, you mentioned climate, which makes me think about net zero. Um, sure. Increasingly, we're hearing about net zero buildings, net zero schools. So, but, you know, for maybe the lay person who's listening, because uh, we hear a lot of these terms get thrown out and I think maybe some people just kind of nod. And But the re what does net zero, a net zero building mean? What does it mean for a school? And, you know, talk a little bit about your experience there. Sure. So uh, fortunately, I've had some experience designing some net zero schools and Corgan has had uh, experienced that before my time as well. So simply stated, net zero means that the building will produce as much energy as it consumes. And the way that it does that is through renewable energy sources such as solar energy, geothermal, and in some cases, uh, wind. So it's, it's about the renewable energy, but also coming with that is creating a building that is very insulated so that when you're cooling the building, you don't get any heat gain. And when you're heating the building, you don't really get much heat loss. So the efficiency of, of that building is really helping to drive uh, the, the net zero goal. It's all about consumption and balancing out consumption versus production of whatever renewable energies you have on site. So I think for this, it really means that schools, we've been talking about how crucial they are to you know, our social fabric in our communities, schools are now gonna to start to become, you know, leaders in energy converse, conservation. If uh, we could really start to take hold of this design, I think net zero is achievable uh, way more than maybe some people think. So uh, if there are any administrators or teachers out there that are interested, I would encourage them 
to look into a little bit because uh, it is the way that we're all going, uh, especially something like solar. We're just seeing the onset of that more and more. You look at the auto industry and they're making huge strides in that way. And now we are making huge strides in our buildings. And then I think together when we start doing those things, we really start to make a meaningful impact beyond our community. We're taking the micro and we're creating a macro effect by just the sheer volume of, of, of what we do. So building on um, your response, AJ, I want to ask you this question, David, because if I, as I think about a net zero uh, school uh, in a previous episode, we talked about the fact that often schools um, exist for 20 or 30 or 40 years. I went back to my old high school and I was floored to see, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I was floored to see the school looked largely unchanged. And so what I wonder is, is how... Um, you know, it's one thing to have a new when you're building a new a, a, a new school from the ground up versus retrofitting. And I'm curious um, how you work with communities or administrators to think about looking the long term and and are they asking for net zero buildings or are is Corgan recommending because you're able to show that cost, you know, like the overall total cost of running the building goes down just curious how, like, what's the mindset of your, your clients and thinking about what that long-term investment uh, might look like. And then I would invite, you know, uh, AJ or you, Sangeetha to, to jump in here as well. But just thoughts on that, given that so many of our school buildings tend to just exist for years on end. Uh, well, and I think, um, just to reiterate the, the point about um, something being kind of a fixture in the community or a real hub for uh, community life. The uh, the school that my my kids went to um, in our neighborhood has has been around since the 1920s, and so it's been uh, modified, added on to, changed over time. But the largely the, the the main building is the same, and so I think that because schools have such a, a strong um, identity around in the community, and the community kind of identifies with it, as for all the reasons that AJ said, you know, it's. Uh, it's more than just where the kids learn. It's it's a part of that uh, community's life, and so I think there's a there's an effort to try to preserve that, but also to improve upon it. And I'll I'll defer to um, Sangeetha and AJ about um, Net Zero specifically, but I know that from the community side and as a as a parent and being involved in that, certainly there's been a lot of effort to you know keep the things that are good about a school while still looking for improvements. Yeah, I'll I'll add on to that, um, Portia. It's 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 just that um, school buildings are usually when we design it that we design them to be fifty year buildings, and I believe um, Train has done some research on existing uh, school facilities all over the United States, and it's it's um, it's pushing uh, close to a, a century is what you're seeing. So a couple of things over there, uh, the net zero equation. I think you had alluded to it in the previous uh, question. Uh, we we really recommend um, some some sustainable features that could be incorporated in, in facilities because um, you want to make sure that uh, the owners don't have to spend a lot of um, their resources on maintaining a building. Uh, we want something that um, is easy to maintain and um, quite um, quite easy to um, to keep up over a period of time. So that being said, um, what we are finding is on existing buildings, it's uh, it's not impossible, but it is harder to actually achieve um, net zero uh, in an existing building. But there are a lot of sustainable features that could be very easily incorporated. Um, another um, key thing about net zero buildings, especially in schools, is that they become teaching tools. So um, in a lot of examples that we've done in the past, we made sure that we work closely with educators, integrate their curriculum, and make the building itself a teaching tool, um, showing learning on display by exposing systems, um, by explaining the uh, sustainable Aspects. So when uh, when students go to school, they actually experience the building and learn from the building um, outside the classroom setting. I, I love that. And AJ, I wonder um, if you could talk about some net zero school success stories uh, that you've um, that you're particularly you know excited to share. Sure. I, I think what what I want to touch on Sangeetha just said is is this is a teaching tool, but it's a teaching tool for more than just students. 
we have a school that we've done here in Texas that's been open for, um, I believe, 10 years, a little over 10 years. And the great thing about that school is educators and administrators from all over uh, come to that school to tour it, learn about net zero, see how it's in practice. So like, now we're, we're not just teaching kids really good habits and really good philosophies on conservation, but now adults and decision makers are coming, seeing it firsthand. And to your question earlier, that's helping inspire them to engage in net zero or energy efficient design. Um, but like Sangeetha was saying, an existing building, a little harder to do such things, but her point is, is a really valid one that if you don't get all the way to net zero, if you say replace windows, they're inefficient, you're really starting to gain efficiency, reduce consumption. If you put a cool roof on top of the existing, which districts do all the time, you're gaining even more. So to her point, you're starting to really cut into how much the districts have to use public money to maintain these buildings. So it really is a good uh, thing for everyone. So Sangeetha, I want to pull on a thread around your research. Uh, your research. Um, it, one of the things we started out this conversation talking about is just uh, we're living, we're, you know, we are in the midst of a pandemic still. Um, and so the health and wellness of a of, of our of our children and and their teachers and administrators in the building. Can you share any data that um, from your research around around this? I, I think again, I think as a parent, I really wasn't a, uh, I didn't think that much about the building contributing or not contributing to the health and wellness of my child until a year ago. And now I want to know what kind of filters they're using and what's the airflow like and you know, that's, and maybe it's because I work for train, but I also think it's really because we understand so much more about um, how important the, the structure is and how, and so talk a little bit about what you learned in your research around health and wellness uh, for children uh, and buildings. Sure. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, Gorgon has done extensive research both internally, and then we also lean into a lot of research that's available, um, all of the expertise that's available. Uh, but as as uh, many people in the in the education uh, sector know, the the stats about students um, humming themselves during the last 14 months has been quite sobering, um, and it's all because of you know the health and well-being aspect of it. Um, so what we did was we actually when when we do our visioning sessions with all of the stakeholders, the leadership, we we really focus on what the data and research says based on their aspirations. So one of the things that comes up about every single time is the um, the mental and emotional well-being of students. If you think about it like you know 90 something percent is, uh, of our time is spent indoors and in a student's life all of that you know percent but so many hours um is spent in schools so we want to make sure that we actually um look into it so one of the studies that i want to uh, kind of draw your attention to is called a head study it was done in the you know, in the uk and um, it uh, took into account about 150 elementary schools. And uh, what was really intriguing about this was it um, sort of divided up the, the big buckets, right? There's a sensory bucket, there's a social, and then there is a self. So the sensory is all the things that you could do in, in a classroom or a learning environment and how that not only moves the needle of test scores, it actually improves the well-being of the students and the teachers. Um, just adding natural light, the, the, uh, the point of uh, making sure that the the air is not stale, the air exchanges um, are where they need to be. The social aspect, again, comes into uh, play for collaboration spaces. You know, the types of spaces are very different for collaboration when you look at a pre-K um, sort of an environment versus a higher ed and, the you know, all of the stuff in between it. But if you think about it, again, um, in a, in a HVAC setting, typically there's not that much air that's pushed into a corridor because, you know, that's where people are moving. But if you're going to be putting these collaboration spaces along um, these access corridors, um, how is that going to be designed? How is that going to be changed? And then the last piece is about the self. It's about, um, again, these students want agency over learning. They want to learn. Um, it's all about learning in these uh, maker spaces, not just sitting in, at a desk all day long and listening to a teacher uh, lecture. So if we're going to start um, 
using these types of spaces, how is the building um, shaping or how are the building systems um, going to overlay? So there's a lot of um, data out there. There's a lot of research that's already done. Uh, one of the things we're also um, very, you know, it's like, how do you future proof a building, right? Like, you know, with the changes in technology and everything that's happening, um, by the time you build it, it's already the systems and the the, um, the technology you put in it is obsolete. So you really can't um, future proof it, but you can make it in such a way that it is um, flexible enough and it's got all of the systems and the utilities in place so it can evolve um, over time where um, nothing becomes obsolete. You gotta make some change um, as you move through it, but not a whole lot of time and most importantly resources are spent on it. So something you say, Sangeeta, about you know not necessarily being able to future proof a building, but I'm wondering, and I'll maybe start with you and then I'll invite David and AJ, um, is you talk a little bit about trends. So you know based on the research or based on what your uh, what your clients are asking for, what kind of trends are you say- seeing in the K-12 space? So um, that's a great question. I think it's uh, it's important to sort of look at a track record, which is a which is a trend. But sure. one of the things yeah. we are saying is um, the personalized nature of education. You mm. know that all students are not going to be learning the same way. We've talked about it throughout the session about you know how every student is different. So how do you personalize the education so you engage the learner that's coming to your building um, so that they can succeed in on their own terms. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is this uh, overlay of technology and hybrid um, education. So mm. um, are, do we, we are actually starting to incorporate classrooms that almost look like studios or a uh, black box theater where uh, you have this educator that is being able to, you know, um, basically produce um, their own movie that is their lesson and create this repository. Because if you have this excellent educator that can that can reach students, then if they are in one building, now you've actually been, you're able to take them and bring them to the homes of students so they can actually learn from this excellent and educators. So um, these lecture capture type of spaces, we are seeing um, rapidly uh, being incorporated in higher ed, and uh, we are actually recommending them even for high school and, um, you know, the K-12 institutions. Um, the other uh, important um, aspect, which is really exciting, is the uh, sustainability component of it. Um, these students, again, are very astute. They have access to a lot of information that uh, we as um, elementary school students um, don't have. Um, I actually have a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, and my 10-year-old is up to date on what's on CNN by the time I come home because it's summer. Um, so it's it's quite fascinating to see how engaged they are. And so, um, and, and you know, they're asking questions. It's like, well, that's fine. But if it's, if the, if Alaska is not going to be the way it is in 20 years, how am I going to go there for a vacation? And so they are, they really want to make sure that um, um, they're almost not sure that uh, we're doing and doing the necessary things or doing enough. Um, And so they want to, again, have agency over climate change and some of these uh, important topics. So being able to engage them um, and having that uh, be highlighted, like AJ said before, uh, the building being a teaching tool is another huge aspect that we are saying. So I know those are sort of um, all over the spectrum, but um, these are some of the things that keep bubbling up no matter what Um, type of building we're designing, what type of client, uh, regardless of location almost. Um, So it's been quite interesting how uh, classrooms are transforming into these active learning environments. David, you are nodding your head. What would you add to to that? Well, I think um, mostly around what uh, Sagitha was saying about um, students wanting to have agency or they're they're full of information and passion about um, things that they care about. And not not just um, climate, but I think you know diversity, equity, inclusion is on their minds um, a lot, and and so I think when we're thinking about flexible learning spaces, um, I think we're also thinking about inclusive spaces. That um, what what can we do as designers to encourage people to be together and to learn from each other? So I think that's something that's going to be with us for a long time. At least I, I hope so. Can you give me an example of what, and it's, you know, we talk about these terms certainly in the sense, in that sense of our business being diverse, uh, uh, mm-hmm. equitable and inclusive. What does a, an, what does an ex- inclusive space look like in the K in the K-12 context? 
Well, I think um, acknowledging differences in cognition, um, differences in physical abilities, and making spaces that um, eliminate barriers and also provide for uh, for neurosensory differences and, and emotional differences, things like that. So, for example, um, uh, a child may have a fear of large spaces, and so a large classroom might be frightening. So, and others may be afraid of small spaces. So, you, but if you provide um, places for both of those kids to feel comfortable within a space that they can share together, um, through design, you can you can start to accommodate just a few of those differences. I love that you explain that um, because I think, you know, again, you know, most of us are, we're, we're parents here. We'll have a lot of parents listening and it does seem like there's an interesting, I wouldn't call it a trend. I'm really glad to see us evolve to be able to accommodate kids with different neurosensory differences. So I, this question go is for the three of you, you know, as we, um, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because as we are living through a time of disruption on so many levels, it's also, we all know that just, we know that disruption creates opportunity as well. And so maybe with that as the framework, um, starting with you, David, as you look out ahead, what are you most hopeful for, excited for, as you think about the work that Corgan's doing, the impact that you're having in communities, what is, what is making you wake up, um, ex, you know, excited about what, um, what the firm is doing right now? Well, I think it's, um, it, you know, Sangeet didn't talk about trends and I think trends are things that we follow, but I think what I'm, I'm a really proud of Corgan for uh, taking a leadership position and bringing new ideas to communities, really challenging uh, assumptions, um, really challenging our clients to do um, to do more and better and uh, bringing them along that journey with us. And I, I think we've um, the education team, AJ, Sangeeta and others are really doing a fantastic job at that in, in the communities they serve. So just like you alluded before, um, disruption is what causes um, or forces innovation. And so I think um, it has been a very challenging time for everyone. Um, and um, what I'm hopeful for, well, you have to be hopeful, right? Because otherwise um, we can't get anywhere. But what uh, what I'm really excited about is the fact that uh, we constantly um, push ideas or at least present them to clients. And time and time again, um, they've they've sort of surprised us and how far they would go. So one of the things we've learned is, you know, you don't just assume that that particular community or that particular group of stakeholders cannot or will not handle something. So our idea has always been bring the, the most creative, innovative solution that they could afford that they want um, and see what the their feedback is. And so um, that, that makes me really hopeful. And, and quite honestly, it, it's the small uh, droplets that cause the ripples. Like uh, it, I've always believed and know that education is the only thing that can uh, change the world. And, and I'm very passionate about it. And I think it's about making those small, small incremental changes. And that's what's going to move the needle in the right direction, whether in terms of design, whether it's in terms of sustainability, whether it's in terms of DEI initiatives, um, because uh, these students are our future. And so we have to invest our time, resources, and our ideas um, into them because they are the ones that are going to change the world for us. AJ. Yeah, so disruption is the great catalyst for opportunity, but this disruption of the pandemic to me has also become a, a big factor and a huge realization uh, here in the States and other places. This pandemic has really showed us how connected we all are and how important our schools are to uh, the kids' mental health, the, the parents' mental health, and just the health of the community. Uh, I'm really hopeful because I think that realization did set in when kids weren't at school and we really started to understand how important mm. the day-to-day -day is. So uh, hopefully now that we understand that, there will be no qualms about investing in our kids, which really is investing in the future of not just um, our country, but really, as Sangeeta said, we're all global citizens. We're connected in so many ways now. And uh, being in school, developing social skills and communication I, I think is super critical uh, to the success for the next 10, 20 years. 
So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're starting a new chapter in public education and it's going to be valued uh, as much as it should be because to me, uh, it is the great equalizer and the opportunity creator for her, for that kid uh, to realize dreams that they may have as they become young adults and adults. So thank you for that, AJ. And maybe one last question for the three of you, um, which is really around your parting thoughts or insights around where we're headed in terms of K-12 uh, building and design or any parting thoughts that you'd like to share. David, I'm going to start with you. I think, well, a lot's been said through this conversation about um, the importance of the communities we serve and the importance of just recognizing that um, an environment, how much it contributes to uh, students' well-being, um, parents' well-being, as AJ said. I, I hope that we will take lessons from the last 18 months in addition to everything else that we know about um, designing for you know, high performing spaces and carry that forward uh, with you know, new energy and new resolve to, to really make great spaces for, for our kids. Thank you, David. AJ? Uh, I think where we're headed is, uh, you know, in the past, higher education models and universities and colleges have informed what we do in K-12 design. But as we've alluded to earlier, that, that change is very slow to get put in place. But I think this is really gonna start to maybe accelerate looking at those higher ed models and incorporating those into our elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Uh, it all kind of goes back to what we were saying about hybrid. Um, there's going to be a mix of virtual and in-person. And I think um, we look to those, those higher education institutions to really inform uh, best practices and, and really in trends. So I think that starts to accelerate how we really transform our designs and how we accommodate kids. Um, there's, as we've seen, they're super res resilient, they're, they're brilliant, and uh, I think they would thrive in such an environment. So I'm, I'm really excited to see where we take this as designers um, in the coming years. And Sangeetha. We, we are finally paying attention to public education and giving it the respect it had always um, deserved. Um, but it's about creating uh, and making schools uh, a place, right, where um, students actually go for their social, emotional, and uh, mental uh, well-being and their social skills. And, and so we are excited because we are seeing the evolution of um, outdoor spaces. We are seeing the evolution of better systems uh, because for, for communities and buildings that already had all these in place, they were able to quickly pivot and actually adapt and, and be able to bring their kids sooner and, and create those safety measures. So um, what we're going to see, which we are very excited about, is um, taking all of the lessons learned and like folding them into our new design. So uh, education environments that we are going to create um, can quickly adapt can pivot and then produce the, the students that we all need for tomorrow. Well, David Usher, AJ Sesteta, and Sangeetha Karthik, thank you so much for your time today and for such an engaging conversation. I can't think of a better time for us to be talking about the spaces that um, not only our children, but so many of us rely on uh, in our communities. And thank you for the um, phenomenal work that you're doing um, through Corrigan as well. We appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was great. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity.